Maybe when our life feels that way, it's hard to see glory in it, right? But the idea about glory to glory, the Bible clearly tells us that sometimes what God wants to do for his glory doesn't look very glorious when we're going through it, right? And that's just kind of part of the way it is. And uh, we're going to kind of talk about that today a little bit in the context of uh, what it means for you to be ready for what we're going to call a Red Sea experience. And if you know anything about the story of Moses and uh, and what happened with him and the Israelites leading them out of Egypt. You kind of got a feel maybe for what we're going to talk about today. But the idea is that, that God wants us to understand that daring faith involves persevering when I don't feel like it. And when it feels like it's a bummer to bummer kind of thing, right, then that's one of those times probably when the, you don't want to persevere. That's the last thing I want to do is persevere when things are looking so bleak and things are looking so rough. Well, Moses had that. And Moses was a guy who very, 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 I guess you might say reluctantly responded to God's call on his life. And uh, he had given God all kind of excuses when God said, Moses, you're the guy I've got a special deal I want you to do for me, and that is to lead these Egyptian, excuse me, these Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. And uh, Moses came back with all these excuses. I can't talk very well. I'm not very charismatic. I can't get people. I can't influence them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And God came back to him and he said this. And by the way, this is a message that many of us need to hear from God. So I, I, want, I want you to hear this from God right now. <laughs> he said, Moses, I don't give a rip about your excuses. Okay, you might want to substitute our own name in there sometimes, right? Because if I'm calling you and asking you to do something, don't you think I'm going to take care of filling in the blanks that you have in your life? You see the point? And Moses finally said, yeah, 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 okay. I'm, I'm in, Lord, I'm in. And you know what? That's what God's waiting for a lot of us to do, to say, okay, God, I'm all in. I understand that in spite of my limitations, in spite of those things that I can't do well, when you call me to do something, when you tell me that this is the direction you want me to take, yeah, you know what? I, I guess you probably are capable of filling in those things that I can't, right? And Moses said that, and as a result, he went on, and God used him to do great things. But it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Moses learned, and he gave us good lessons, I think, on what it means to persevere when I don't feel like it. As a matter of fact, in that Hall of Fame chapter in Hebrews chapter 11 that we've been looking at uh, in, these past few, uh, in these past few weeks, we read, it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible, God himself. He kept his eyes on God and not all the problems that he found around him when he was leading these uh, Israelites out of the nation of Egypt. And this was a really tough situation that he had. Perhaps you've been through a Red Sea experience where uh, you found the going really tough. Perhaps you're going through one right now. If you haven't been through one, you will be going through one. Just be ready for it. You will. I want to share with you the story of one of our dear folks who uh, is a very faithful member of our congregation who's not able to be with us today simply because of the condition that she's going to describe to you in this story. But even in her absence, I want you to give a really big, nice, warm welcome uh, because her husband's here and give it to him, right, who's on our drums in the back uh, a lot of Sundays. Uh, and I want to introduce you to hear the story of Miss Kathy Ernst. Let's give her a big hand as she comes on the screen. drummers here at Integrity Church. We've been married for over 24 years and we have three adopted children, two of which you all know, LJ and Macy Lynn, and another son by the name of Alec who lives out of state. Okay, so in 2008 I started having um, migraines and pain and numbness on the left side of my body and so we started going to doctors. They did um, x-rays of my neck, my spine. They did <clears throat> blood tests, whatever they needed to do to figure it out. And in one of the MRIs, they showed uh, a lesion in my brain. And that was the first one we found. And so they did a more in-depth MRI and they found out that there were several. Uh, they had to do a lot of blood work and a spinal tap. Not fun. Not a good thing. 
But anyways, uh, in a total of two years of time span, uh, it took two years for all those tests and the results to get through and done. And in November of 2010, I was diagnosed with relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. There is no known no cure for MS. They just treat the symptoms and they give you disease modifying drugs. After we got the diagnosis, it was time for figuring out what we were going to do, which ways we were going to lead, uh, go with medications. Um, and it was really a faith struggle. I really had to learn to trust the Lord that He knew what was best for me and that He would give us wisdom and discernment in what we needed to do. And the added stress of going through the adoption at that particular time uh, caused a lot of heart tugging. I didn't want to take on the responsibility of children not knowing if I would be able to care for them later on. But um, God knows what He's doing. He worked it all out. Have a pretty good relationship with my kids. They are mine, and um, they know that. Um, and I just have to learn to trust the Lord. I don't know sometimes if I'll be able to get up and walk that morning, or I may need a wheelchair later on during the day. But we get through it, and He has always been faithful to provide everything that I've needed so far. I don't know if uh, anybody here has a life verse, but mine is Isaiah 58, 11. And the verse, we got to read that, so hold on. It said, the Lord will lead you and satisfy you in a parched land and strengthen your bones and you will be like a well-ordered garden, like a spring whose waters never run dry. And uh, God did that for us. He kept us right in the midst of all of that chaos. He kept us in his hands, and he provided everything we needed. Um, I think Steve and I grew closer in our relationship. Um, I've come to, to depend on him a little bit more. And I'm a very independent person, so that was a little different. Um, I even let him cook in my kitchen, and that's not normal. <laughs> But that is my life verse, and I, I trust the Lord to lead me wherever I need to go. And that meant moving up here, because I would not have had the benefits that I have now if we didn't. So here we are. It is 2018. It's been 10 years since a full diagnosis. We're still going. We still serve at church. I support my husband and all that he does ministry-wise. Just do the best we can. Take it one day at a time. I try not to worry too much about the future because only God knows what that is. And I trust He has a plan for us. He has brought us this far, and I know He will see us through. Kathy's story is a story of courage. To know her <coughs> is to know courage and to see courage. And that's her life, persevering even when she may not feel like it. God calls us to do that. So today I want us to share Moses' experience. As we find the story in Exodus chapter 13 and 14, we find the Israelites now are trapped. They're trapped between the Red Sea and the pursuit of the Egyptians' army. Or the, but how did we get there? How did we get there? Well, uh, it all started 430 years earlier. When Joseph, toward the end of his life, had his people, the Israelites, move to the land of Goshen. Uh, we've uh, looked at Joseph's story a couple of times in the course uh, of our history at Integrity. And uh, they went there to uh, move out of the starvation that was there in the land of Canaan. But what happened was, over the years, as they stayed there, uh, the relationship went from one of cooperative collaboration between the Israelites and the Egyptians to one of slavery and bondage. And so for the past 430 years, uh, for the most part, the Israelites have been the slaves of, of, the, uh, of the Egyptians, living in poverty, living in abuse, living in detestable conditions in many ways. And so now God had heard the cries of his people, and he sent Moses as the one who would be the deliverer. So 
we find ourselves there at the Red Sea with the Israelites being faced with a decision. What would they do? Well, my contention is that we all have Red Sea experiences. Sometimes we don't realize that we're having those. Sometimes we don't recognize the fact that we're there at the edge of the Red Sea and that there's an enemy right behind us and we have to make a decision. To step back away from the Red Sea is to move into a place of mediocrity. To take a step forward is to take a step of faith. And so what is a Red Sea experience? I took a shot this morning at trying to define what a Red Sea experience really is, and I want to share that with you. And I want to see if you have situations in your life or have had situations in your life where these criteria have been met for you. So a Red Sea experience is one in which God brings you to a place of a big decision. To follow Him in a Red Sea experience means that you cannot stay where you currently are. It means that you have to make some short term that you're willing to make some short term sacrifices for the purposes of obeying God and moving to a new place in life. I'm not I'm talking about a geographic place. I'm talking about perhaps a spiritual place or a place of relationships with others. And there you can be of greater impact in building the kingdom of God. So according to what we have on the board, a Red Sea experience involves a big decision. It means that we can't stay where we are. It means that there are short-term sacrifices that must be made. And it causes us to have to go to a new place in life. But we do that in view of longer-term blessings that God has for us. And the whole purpose of a Red Sea experience is for you to have greater impact in God's kingdom. So have you had one of those experiences? Are you going through one right now? My question is for you, what do you need to move forward in that experience? My other point today is... In, is to help grab you and to help you understand how you can prepare for the next Red Sea experience. My wife and I have easily, we've been able to pretty much ascertain that we've had at least five of these things. Five Red Sea experiences when we were called to decisions and situations that met these <coughs> criteria. The first one of those when we were together was when I left the corporate world to go into vocational ministry and uh, left behind a pretty good job and left behind a a heck of a lot of money on the table. Then a few years later after that, God called us to start Integrity Church. He said, I know you took a you know, big pay cut before. Now I want you to take a pay cut to nothing, right? Start this church, right? Uh, and, uh, and, and move forward, right? Uh, and then a few years after that, uh, we kind of had things going. Um, God called us to go and to make a move across the world uh, to bring a little girl home with us. And then God said, I want you to, uh, I want you to do a couple of other things uh, while you're at it, he said, I want you to uh, take your ministry and I want you to do something kind of wild and crazy. And I want you to take it not only from the church, but also into the marketplace. And so uh, to start a business where I, was a, I would be able to do that, to take the ministry that we do here at Integrity uh, into the marketplace where I work with organizations in the secular world. And then also God said in the midst of all that somewhere, take about a year of your life. I don't you write a book because there are problems in churches that they need help with around planning and organizational structure and that kind of thing. And God's used that down through the years. I don't know what, maybe I might have missed a couple there. My fear, as I've told you before, is when God's called me to do something and I didn't do it. Those are the things that kind of keep me up at night. Not the things where I figured it out, right, or where God helped me figure it out, but the times when I missed what he's calling me to do. And I know there are times in that situation as well. I know there will be different situations. I know there will be new situations that will come up. For me and Tammy, I know that there will be situations for you when you are going to be confronted with the possibility of a Red Sea experience. So as we look at this story today, we're going to see three sets of characters, three sets of characters. The first of those is Moses himself. Moses, who is the one who God has anointed to lead the Egyptians, is the one, or excuse me, the Israelites, is perhaps the one that we're most, most familiar with. If you've been in church for a long time, you've undoubtedly heard the story because this is one of the monumental uh, miracles that we know of in Scripture. But there are two other sets of characters as well. They are the Israelites who God was leading. They needed desperately someone to help them move forward. They were very needy. For 430 years, they, didn't have, they, they weren't able to do anything for themselves. They didn't make any decisions for themselves. They had no money to make decisions around. They didn't know how to live outside of slavery. And yet God would call them to a special anointing a vision for the nation 
that goes beyond Egypt into the land of promise of Canaan where they would build a new nation that would be subservient to God himself. And so those folks, though, did not know how to live. They knew next to nothing. And then there was the Egyptian army, those who would chase after the Israelites and try to bring them home or bring them back because at some point uh, after you might be aware of 10 plagues that God sent on the nation of Egypt and Pharaoh in order to cause Pharaoh to let the people go. Now those places, not like Pharaoh was a nice guy and he said, hey, you guys can go and go fulfill the mission that God's given you. Not at all. God sent 10 destructive plagues upon the nation. And the 10th one was the one where all the firstborn uh, of the nation of Israel, were, they died. They, they, God took their life. The angel of death passed over. And that was the plague because Pharaoh would not let his people go. And so Pharaoh was not a really nice guy. And so we're going to see in the story where he changes his mind. He says, wait a minute, I've let them go. And what was I thinking? What about our economy? What about all those, that slave labor, that sweatshop labor that we're losing by letting them go? And we're going to see what happens with that. But many of us uh, can identify with the Egyptian army, whether you realize it or not, because the Egyptian army was there to pursue and to keep Israel from fulfilling their vision. So many of us, we can probably relate to Moses. Maybe God's calling us to lead something special. Maybe he already has called you. Maybe you can identify with the Israelite army because you know what, you're not the Israelite army, but the population of Israel, the congregation. You need leading. You need leading into a better place where God wants you to be. But I would dare say that some of us, if we're honest, could probably identify with the, the Egyptian army as well. Many Christ followers, the way they live their lives pulls other people back out of the momentum for God to do something with them. And they wind up being negative factors on others who are trying to find the way. So who are you? Are you the leader that God's calling Moses to be? Are you the Israelite who needs, who needs guidance and you need to grow and you need help moving forward? Or are you that member of the Israelite army who your impact on others is causing them uh, to, to, to be dragged down in their pursuit of growing in Christ. So in this story, uh, I want us to highlight about six or seven things that we need to be aware of, that we need to be preparing in our lives in order for us to be ready for that next Red Sea experience, because it is coming. It is coming. You will find yourself there at the Jordan, at the, excuse me, at the Red Sea shore with nowhere to go, but either forwards or backwards. So we pick up the story in uh, chapter 13 of the book of Exodus in verse 17. And it says here, it tells us that when Pharaoh finally let the people go, God did not lead them along the main road that runs through the Philistine territory, even though that was the shortest route to the promised land. Let me tell you what's going to happen here. If you're going to be ready for the Red Sea experiences, you're going to have to learn to flex when God shifts your path. You're going to have to learn to shift when God shifts your path. You're going to have to flex. You're going to have to adapt. You're going to have to change your plans. The Bible says that plans are good. We should plan. But when God intervenes and shifts things, he challenges things, and he brings about a different circumstance, we have to be ready to flex with him. We are to plan, but we have to be willing to be <coughs> flexible. You see what happened here. If you look at the map, if you look at the map and see where the Israelites were in Egypt, and if you kind of just do a straight line as the crow flies up toward the land. <coughs> thank you, guys. That's, that's awesome. Thank you, Pete. If you take a straight look from the land of Goshen over here toward the left at the top of the map, over to where it says Canaan to the right, that journey should have taken around 11 or 12 or 13 days. That's all. Even for a million people to, get to take. And that's about what the size of the Israelite congregation looked like. But what God did was, God said, because if I lead you through that land, you're going to come into contact with the Philistines. And God knew that if they went near the Philistines, the Philistines would be so strong that they would absolutely destroy the congregation of Israel. Because the congregation of Israel was definitely not a fighting force. There was no military ability there. And so God said, I want you to take them south. I want you to avoid those areas that, were, that would be uh, problematic uh, for the people that would cause a lack of safety and would cause danger. And so he led them south. Uh, down to a couple of areas. And we'll come back to this a little bit later as we continue the journey. But here's the point. God knows what he's doing. 
God knows what he's doing. Sometimes he's going to shift your path. He's going to change the way he has for you, and we're not going to understand it. He might be keeping us from the Philistines in our lives. He might be keeping us from doing something self-destructive. And a lot of times what we do, because we don't understand it, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago in the series, we may not cooperate with him. The way he works is beyond our understanding. And one of the reasons that he also wanted to kind of move the Israelites south instead of straight ahead is that uh, he didn't want them to just cut and run. The closer they went, the easier the journey, uh, even if the, if the Philistines did not confront them, God did not want the Israelites just kind of peeling off and going back to Egypt, which would have been a big temptation for them to do that. Here's the second thing that we need to understand that God uh, wants us to get as we prepare for the Red Sea experience. He wants us to maintain focus on God's means of leading us. You see, God leads you and he leads me. And we need to maintain focus on how he does that. Now, let me give you this passage, which is very important. The Israelites left Succoth and camped at Ethium on the edge of the wilderness in the, in the diagram we saw a minute ago. The Lord went ahead, went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of a cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. So I know what you're thinking. The same thing I've thought often when I read this passage. It really would be cool if God would give me a cloud or fire to, to put ahead of me. Kind of leave. Would you, everybody, you up on that? Is that good? Got everybody? Yeah, amen, right? That'd be awesome if we could do that, right? But he did this for the Israelites, and they're a little different than we are, okay? Because the Israelites had lived in a pagan nation for all those years and had no access, really little access to, to, what the, Bible, or to the works of the prophet or, or the, the, the historical books, which was all that, that existed at that point in time. They didn't know any better. They didn't have anything better. You and I have the benefit of a lifetime of growing up in a country where we have been free to learn about what God says and what the truth is. Also, we have this thing right here, which is his word. We don't need a cloud. We don't need a pillar of fire ahead of us as much as we would like to have that. That would be easy, right? That would make life so much easier if we had that, right? But here's the point. If we had those things to lead us, life would no longer be about faith because everything would be certain. And you know what? God tells us time and again that the major metric, the measure of your spiritual growth is the faith that you have in your life. Now, let me say this. I'm not talking about the faith that you say you have. The faith that you say you have is null and void. I can tell you all day and probably do a pretty good job because I'm a pretty persuasive speaker, and I can tell you that I have a lot of faith. But if you're wise, you'll realize that, hey, I don't know if that line bud shooting me is really true until what? I have a reason to exercise it. Does that make sense? We can talk about having faith all we want, but until we're placed in a situation where we have to exercise it, right, we will never know whether or not we really have that faith. Some of you have been in those situations where you've been called on to exercise it. For many of you, perhaps you haven't gotten to the place in life yet where you've really had to exercise that faith. But God, as a part of the Red Sea experience, wants you to exercise that faith. So while God allowed the cloud and the fire to lead the Israelites, how does God lead us today? Well, I want to go back to a very safe place, a Bible study that uh, has got me in trouble three times now because every time I do it, God seems to bring one of these Red Sea experiences along with it. And it's a study called Experiencing God. And in the study, it lets us know that God primarily uses four means to lead us, to speak to us, and show us the direction to go. First of all, his word, the Bible. He will not speak to you outside of what his Bible already says. So if you're trying to do something that God has already said in his word is not the direction you need to take, and you're trying to convince yourself that it is, I can tell you you're wrong. Because God does everything in accordance with his word. The second way is through prayer. God communicates with you and I through prayer, right? Right? We've talked about that quite a bit in the past few months. We have prayer teams that meet uh, in the services 
Uh, every, if you're interested in joining one of those prayer teams, we have a team that meets during the first service, one that meets in the second service, some very faithful people who pray for you in the service. If you would want to join one of those teams, I'd love for you to do that. You just take that Integrity Connect card and just write prayer on it. And Pastor Ray will get with you uh, and help you know how you can do that. God speaks to us through circumstances. Circumstances. God leads us that way through circumstances. Uh, Just the way things are going, right? He kind of shows up in circumstances. And the more mature we get, the more we grow, uh, the better we can see him through those circumstances. You know who else God works? He works through the counsel of others, the wise counsel of others. There's a reason the Bible says if you want to be wise... Hang out with the wise. Some of y'all need a new set of friends. Because for a lot of y'all, the people you're hanging out with are not the people who are going to lead you toward a life of greater wisdom. God says, walk with the wise, and then you will be wise. And so the counsel of others is very important. God works through four ways. Many of us, what we do a lot of times in relationships, this thing on friends, just a little, this is free, all right, it's just extra, right? A lot of times we get into relationships with people and it becomes a situation where Pastor Rick Warren talks about in the uh, study on Daring Faith in the small group study, we get involved with VDPs, very draining people, and they drain the heck out of us. When God really wants us to be involved with who? (coughs) Very, what's the word? Inspiring people. So the question I have for you, do people, would you be categorized as an individual? Are you a VDP or are you a VIP? You see, God calls us to move to the place where we're VIPs. We're inspiring others to be the best they can be. And as you're thinking about who you need to hang out with, who you need to spend your relational capital on, you need to be focusing on finding some VIPs. Quit trying to rescue the VDPs in your life. They're just dragging you down with them in many ways. Moses finds himself now in charge of a congregation of VDPs. And a lot of his charge is to turn them into VIPs because that's where God wants them to be in the vision and the mission that he has for them. That's what God wants Integrity Church to be as well, a group of VIPs who are inspiring people to be the best that they can be. So here's the third thing that we need to know about preparing for a Red Sea experience, and that is that we need to exercise patience while God works his greater plan that is unknown to me. Circle, once write it in and circle it, unknown to me. That is the essence of faith. Because God's plan for you and me is unknown to us in its entirety, we, God will show us pieces here and there, right? We know our purpose. We talk about that, right? To glorify God, to to, to grow and to, uh, to, to reach others for him, to go out on the mission field, to, to, to go out and, 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 to, and to connect with others, to be in our small groups where we have community because Christianity is not a solo act. Many of you are still trying to convince yourself that Christianity is a solo act and you do not have a systematic way that you can gather with other people in a support system. You've got to get that figured out because you're going to be missing God's plan for your life as long as you leave that part out of God's plan for you. And so with this, God says that this greater plan is unknown to me and therefore you have to walk by faith. You have no choice because it's unknown to me. When I said I do 35 years ago, I had no idea what the future would hold. I had a pretty good thought that it was going to be a pretty good one, and it's, been, it's far exceeded my expectations so many times over and over and over. And I know that many of you all can say that as well here in the earshot of my voice as well. But I didn't know. I had to exercise faith. Tammy had to exercise a great deal of faith when she agreed to become my wife. Some of you are laughing because you know she had to do a lot, right? She had to do a lot more than you did, but I know. I realize that. That's exactly right. But here we got to exercise patience because look at what happens in verses 1 through 4 of uh, chapter 14. This this story laps over into chapter 14. The Lord gave these instructions to Moses. He said, Order the Israelites to turn back and camp by Piharoth between Migdal and the sea. Camp there along the shore across from Baal Zephon. Then Pharaoh will think that the Israelites are confused and they are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I've planned this in order to display my glory through Pharaoh and his whole army. Pete, can we have that that visual again of the map? 
real quickly. Here's what happened. God says, I want you to, we're going to do a little diversionary tactic here, Moses. I want you to take the group of, of Israelites, and I, what I want you to do is you get down closer down there to, to, to where you're going to cross in the Gulf of uh, uh, Aqua, Aquaba. Aqua, uh, excuse me. That was what it was known as in the Red Sea. Uh, I want you to kind of circle around in there, and I want you to kind of put on this air of confusion because I really want the, I'm, I want the Egyptian army to chase back after you guys. Now, does that make a lot of sense? God, you led me down here. You got us here, and we don't have anywhere to go because we're around just, just this shoreline, and now you're telling me you're going to send our enemies after us again. Do you really know what you're doing, God? You ever had a moment like that where you said, God, do you really what, know what you're doing on this? You ever had one of the? I have numerous times in my life where I resorted to my doubts. You know what? It's okay to admit your doubts because, number one, if you don't, you're a liar. Number two, without doubt, there is no faith. Show me faith, and I will show you honest doubts because it takes faith to overcome the doubts. Does that make sense? So we need to be honest with God about our doubts. Because that strengthens our faith when we take the doubts to him. Now, don't take your doubts to an atheist or an agnostic or somebody you like at work who doesn't go to church and they just kind of think you're a little weird for doing it, right? We have a tendency uh, sometimes to do that, and that kind of keeps our doubts going. But the point is that God had a point here. He wanted to do something. And if you read the next few verses, verses 5 through 9, you will find that exactly what happens. The scouts... Uh, Pharaoh sends out a bunch of scouts on, on a super accelerated supersonic horseback, right? And they find, as they're spying on these Israelites, that it looks like they don't know where they're going. They're just going in circles. They look so confused. And so you know what Pharaoh says? Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm thinking about our economy and all that slave labor we lost. What was I thinking? You see, whereas God softened him up through the killing of the firstborn there at Passover before the Israelites left, now what happened? Pharaoh's heart begins to harden again. You ever had that before? God softens your heart, and then after a while, the experience kind of wears off, and you know what? You kind of go back to the way you were. You ever had that? Yeah, I'm sure we have. And so he sends his army after them. Go get them. Bring them back. We need to have them in order for our economy to work. Our GDP is going to go down without them. And so they go, and they find him. And so we find that Moses is in a position now to where he hears the people saying some pretty rough things. So in verses 10 through 14, we discover the next point about getting ready for the Red Sea experience, and that is that we are called to encourage others whose maturity is not as developed as my own. You catch that? We are called in growing in our faith to encourage others whose maturity is not as developed as mine. Now, let me tell you what that really means. I remember all through my life getting to a certain point where I was always looking for other people that I could look to to learn things, that I could get advice from, that I could look to and figure out how to do it. And as my quest continued and I, was fi and I would find those people, God brought some wonderful people in my, lives, in my life to be those folks, there came a point in time when I was probably, I don't know, in my late 20s or 30s, when I began to feel a shift in that. And the point of that shift was God showing me that, Bud, you've been looking for these people all through your life, and I've been providing them, but now it's your turn to be that person for others. You talk about a slap me, knock me down experience that God revealed to me, that was one of them. And for many of you, God has brought you along to the point to where now you are that person that others need to be looking toward. But you know what you're doing? You keep going back to Egypt. Instead of moving forward on the trek from Egypt to the promised land, you're choosing to stay in Egypt because you're not willing to face your fears and walk through them. God is calling you to this new mantle of life where many of you are to be that person. My, my message to you is stop screwing around and accept the place where God has put you and live into it because God wants you to encourage others whose faith is not as well-developed as yours. In the past 21 years, I can, I've heard so many excuses. 
I can't, I'm just not ready yet. I've only been a Christian for five years. And, da, da, da. and I'm thinking, okay. And, and I wish I'd gone back now after all those times. Say, okay, tell me the measure. When will you be ready? What is the number? How many years? How many excuses are you going to give God? before you serve in children's, before you go and go help on disaster relief, or you go to Nicaragua, or you go work with students uh, in our, in our, or go work at the homeless shelter, or do something that God might be cause singing up here, right? Whatever it might be. When is it going to happen? What is your metric when you're going to finally say, okay, God, now it's time? For many of us, you know what? We hadn't even thought about that. We're so focused on trying to figure out how to get back to Egypt, back to that place of mediocrity and stay there, because when I'm there, it's comfortable. You see, here's the ironic thing about Egypt for the Israelites. They were, they be, Israelites beat the crap out of them all the time. They lived in poverty. They didn't have any rights whatsoever. But look at what happens here as we look at verses 10 through 14. As Pharaoh approached... The, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still there in Egypt? We said, Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. You know what the Israelites were? A bunch of whiners. A bunch of crybabies. There's a bunch of VDPs, and they showed it. Because now, guess what? They're being threatened. They're seeing, oh, we might have adversity coming up. We might have to persevere if it's going to work. So many of you, I've seen you persevere through situations, and my admiration for you is so great. So great. And those of you who probably know, you know what I'm talking about. You know I'm talking to you. And I appreciate so much the way that you have moved through things like this. But for others of us, too often we sound like the Egyptians, or excuse me, the Israelites. But look at what Moses did. Moses told the people, he said, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. You see, out of all these millions of people, Moses was the one that God said, go inspire them. Go be their VIP. Convince them even in the face of their whining and their VDP ways of life, inspire them toward a vision that I have for them. Moses did a good job at it. Don't be afraid. Just stand still. Watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. If you know the rest of the story, it's a pretty cool line. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Okay. So I was a little hard on you on this point. I know. I get it. I still love you. But I really want you to come to that point where you realize you're that person that others need to be looking toward. I want the people of Integrity Church to believe that because that's exactly where he wants you to be. Who in your life can you visualize right now in your mind you need to speak some wisdom to? They need the encouragement that you can give them. I'm not talking about your child. I'm not talking about your spouse. That's part of the basic job description that you have. I'm talking about beyond that. I'm talking in the workplace. I'm talking about in your neighborhood. I'm talking about here in this fellowship of believers. Who is that person that you need to be the VIP to? And the flip side of that, who are the people you need to stop being the VDP with? And who are the VDPs that you need to sort of distance yourself from? Because if you don't get that, you will not get this in terms of what God's telling us through Moses. So God really wants us to understand it. Here's the fifth thing about getting ready for the Red Sea experience. You've got to learn how to actively move forward when things get difficult, not backwards toward mediocrity, toward comfort. Yes, I mean, again, they were getting beat up. They had no rights. They, they were just slaves, and they wanted to go back there. The comfort zones that some of us have are still places of great pain. Many of you have places in your life where you will not move out of because you perceive the pain of moving out of it as being greater than the pain you're experiencing right now. Can I tell you that the pain of change is probably, I can tell you, is nothing like the pain you're going through now. 
You see, we oftentimes will choose pain and certainty over release from pain and a, a, a lack of certainty and uncertainty. We will choose pain and certainty over a lack of pain and uncertainty. And it keeps us in places where we cannot become the person that God wants us to become because of the choices that we make. So here's the thing. Actively move forward when things get difficult. I love what God said to Moses. Moses, in that passage from verse 15 through 17, uh, is basically, uh, is, or excuse me, uh, verse 14 uh, and, and forward. He's just he's just kind of, he's just kind of, vomiting, right? Moses saying, oh, God, these people are hard. They're difficult to deal with. What do I do with them? Help us, da, da, da. Look at what Moses said in verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. You know what he's saying? You know what he's saying? Get this. He's saying, quit your praying and get some action going. For many of us, who are Christ followers, a lot of times we use the I got to pray about it thing to simply de delay or avoid, or avoid what God's already calling us to do. Many of us, we are claiming to be so super spiritual by praying about it. Oh, you're really impressive. When it's been made obvious through circumstances in your life and through gifts and talents you have and God's word, you just need to act. Moses is one of the greatest leaders in human history. And God says, quit your praying and get moving. I would dare tell you that for many of us Christ followers, that's exactly what God's saying to us today. Quit spiritualizing everything and just go act. You know, one of the things I've seen as I've been in church work is that a lot of Christians seem to really know how to do a good job of spiritualizing disobedience. We spiritualize disobedience. And the let me pray about it thing, I'm not saying it's all, it, sometimes you got to pray about things, right? But some things you just got to move. You just got to go. Sometimes you're in this place of mediocrity where you're in between the opposition and the Red Sea, and God just says, you got to make the move. And we want to overanalyze it. And yes, that's the time we're most likely to go to the Bible. We might dust it off a little bit and start reading it, right? For many of us, I'm no dummy. Look, I, I've seen this before. We're going through this study on daring faith. It's a tough study. It's tough. The principles in this study are challenging. And if you're going through that and you're going through your small group and you're doing the daily devotions, kudos, hats off to you because you're being challenged. But there's some people in church that bought the book and they realize how tough this stuff is. They may not be here on Sunday morning. They may be, they may be missing their small group or they're just not going through the book for personal devotions. Why? Because to do this study and to live into it is to be challenged, to move from the place of comfort. Perseverance in the face of not feeling like it is precisely what daring faith is all about. So God tells him, get moving. So can you think of, an ex of a Christian spiritual excuse you've made to keep from doing what God wants you to do? I can think of times when I've done that in my life, when I have spiritualized my own disobedience and justified it in a way that I know now did not please God. Here's the sixth thing that we need to really get about getting ready for the neutral zone. And we're, going back, we're winding this thing down, so listen real quick. We're going to move through this real quickly. Is that we need to learn how to trust God's <coughs> deliverance. All right, get, get this. Here the Israelites are. They've got the sea in front of them. They've got, the, the, they got their killers behind them, right, in the Egyptian army. They have nowhere to go. We got to learn how to, first of all, trust God's supernatural protection. I've told you this before, my prayer for my family and for you as a church body, almost every day, I wish I could say I'm perfectly consistent, but I'm not, is that God, that you will put your spiritual hedge of protection around the people that I love in my church family, in my, in my, in my 
my, my, my immediate family, my extended family, etc. And that you will supernaturally protect us from any and everything that Satan would try to throw against us. We need to trust God's supernatural protection. And verse 19 says, And the angel of God who had been leading the people of Israel, I love this, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. Let me give you the image of what's going on. You got the Israelites over here. You got the sea over there. You got the, you got the uh, Egyptians here. So they remember the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud that was leading them. They kind of come around to the back of the Israelite encampment. And what they're going to do now, it's nighttime. So the fire just kind of just starts leaping. Just, it just lights up the night. And so the fire is so bright that, the, that, that the, uh, the, the Egyptians can't even see the Israelites to get to them. And the pillar of cloud comes around and creates the fog that you, they're coming together with the, fire, with the fire, keeps them from seeing where they are. God's supernatural protection. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Israelites and the Egyptians did not approach each other all night. God used the very same cloud that he was using to lead them, to protect them as well. Here's the second thing you got to understand about God's deliverance and how to trust it. you got to trust the just-in-time nature of God's deliverance. you got to get it that God works just in time. That means it's usually not our time. Some of you work in manufacturing in other worlds of occupation where you, you, you work through a just-in-time model of inventory management, which is designed to keep inventory levels down and keep cash flow and efficiencies high uh, in organizations. Uh, God also does this with us. He comes through just in time. And a lot of times what we've done is because God didn't come through in our time, we've abandoned, we've already moved back to Egypt. We're not even on the road anymore. We're not moving there because you know what? It's not in our time. So to understand God's deliverance is to trust the just-in-time nature of his deliverance. Then Moses raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the water with a strong east wind. The wind blew all that night, turning the seabed into dry land. So the people of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground with walls of water on each side. So God performs this amazing miracle in parting the Red Sea in order for them to pass through. He delivers them by just a hair. The Egyptian army was already there. They were just being obstructed by the pillar of fire in the cloud. Here's the third thing that we've got to understand about God's deliverance. We've got to learn to trust God to use our trials and our tests to clear the way for bigger steps of faith. I will kind of tell you this, y'all. When God sends Red Sea experiences, each time you cross over the Red Sea with Him, the next one that comes, the stakes are higher. Why? Because His expectations of you and I are higher. Some of you have not had a Red Sea encounter because you have not moved on the ones that God has sent already in your life. And He is waiting for you to be obedient in some of those other ones that He has placed in front of you. So the Bible tells us that then the Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, charioteers, chased them into the middle of the sea. But just before dawn, the Lord looked down, looked down on the Egyptian army with, from the pillar of fire and cloud, and he threw their forces into total confusion. He twisted their chariot wheels, making their chariots difficult to drive. Let's get out of here, away from these Israelites, the Egyptians shouted. The Lord's fighting for them against Egypt. When all the Israelites had reached the other side, the Lord said to Moses, Raise your hand over the sea again. Then the waters will rush back to cover the Egyptians and their chariots and the charioteers. The passage goes on to tell us, of all the Egyptians who had chased the Israelites into the sea, not a single one survived. So through the very means, the parting of the sea, that God used to allow for the escape of the Israelites, He used the sea coming back together to destroy their opposition. When you are confronted with the Red Sea experience and you move forward against the momentum of the opposition, God will crush your opposition. 
so that you don't have to worry about that. And once you've conquered that, once you've had a Red Sea experience, you've crossed over, you've done that, you know how to handle it next time. I'm not saying God's going to kill the people that you have problems with, but you're going to know as a result of taking that Red Sea experience on. So stop praying for God to kill them. Remember the Ten Commandments. That's just not in His will. Right? He ain't going to do it. You will be so much better equipped to handle them. And I know a number of y'all going through relational garbage right now. You're being attacked by things. You're experiencing some things that you shouldn't have to experience that people might be saying about you that may not be true. I don't know. There's a lot of things that might be going on in your life. But so often we forget to realize that when we follow through and we cross over the Red Sea experiences that God has for us, we can hang with the opposition and we can do it well. (coughs) Finally, last thing as we close, we got to learn to allow God's work in our lives to develop even greater faith and perseverance. Again, every time God leads us through something, every time we take a step of faith, God causes our perseverance to get stronger and stronger. That's why the people who oftentimes have made it through the crossing of one Red Sea experience, usually for them it's not just one. They parlayed that momentum and that growth into another one and into another one and into another one. And God keeps upping the ante, (laughs) taking us to a place of greater blessing and a place of greater impact on the kingdom. Verse 31, when the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians. They were filled with awe before him. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The event itself, the miracle and their deliverance caused the people to trust him even more. Now you may know the rest of the story. The Israelites made it across. They got over to an area close to Mount Sinai where God, a couple of weeks later or so, told Moses, go to the top of the mountain. I'm going to give you the law that we're going to use to run this promised land, this nation of Israel. And as they go up there, as Moses up there for 40 days, what happens down below? The people without Moses, they revert to the pagan worship of the Egyptians. And they completely go awry. You see, sometimes you'll have a Red Sea experience. And once you get beyond it, you let your guard down. And you cross back over the Red Sea and you go back to Egypt. You go back to that place. You work through an addiction. You let your guard down. You go back to it. You deal with a relational problem you've got, something you need to change. You do it for a while. God helps you through it. It's almost miraculous. I've seen it time and again. But you let your guard down. You go back to the way it was. Got to start all over again. Every time you go back across the Red Sea, it's going to get harder and harder for you to get back to where you were after you made that progress. And God's plan for you and I is to keep crossing the Red Seas and not going back. That's His plan for you as He moves you toward that place. So, The big ask today was that you will understand the relationship between perseverance and faith and that you will commit to pushing through adversity as a means of glorifying God. So I ask you, what is a Red Sea in your life today? What what, what are you up against right now? Is it a real problem? Uh, Is there one in the past that you realize you didn't make it all the way through? What is it where you're faced with the decision on whether to step forward in faith or just to stay where you are? Maybe you need to come to your Jesus and give your life to Him. Some of you in this room today, you're not all in on this Jesus thing. Maybe you're part of the way in, but you're not totally sold out. You're doing your family a disservice. You're doing your family a disservice because when we fail to become that person God calls us to be, not only do we suffer, those around us suffer. Those in our sphere of influence suffer as well. And God wants you to move forward in that place. Maybe you need to give your life to him. You need to just, for the first time, accept his gift of salvation. 
and say, Jesus, I need you. I need your gift of eternal life. I need you to become the boss of my life. Some of you, you need to kick an addiction. Maybe it's smoking. Maybe it's drinking. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's prescription drugs. I don't know. Some of you did. Maybe it's pornography. I don't know. You do. Some of you need to mend a relationship that's been impaired. Some of you need to start tithing in obedience to God's command. You need to cross over the Red Sea, and you need to be financially obedient to God. You need to do it the way he says, as we heard from Debbie Summers last week in her story. Some of you need to be, start being the father or the mother that you need to be. Some of you need to stop being the self-centered person who is defensive all the time. You need to learn how to get beyond yourself so that you can be the servant to others that God has called you to be. Others, you might need to join this church or another one. You need to be baptized. Sometimes we don't take these elementary spiritual steps because we're afraid that we might actually have to do something about it. Some of you might need to join me in step one tonight at 5 o'clock, right? Or 5, I'm not sure what time it is on the screen or whatever. It'll tell us. I know I'm overbooked this afternoon. I'll figure out a way to make it work. But some of you need to come there and kind of look at what that step one looks like in your walk of faith in coming to be a Christ follower that God wants you to be. Maybe you've already had a Red Sea experience in your life. God showed up, but things didn't hold. You were down along the base of Mount Sinai. You got discouraged and returned to the place where you were before the Red Sea experience. Maybe you relapsed. God wants you to get that fixed. What will you do? How will you respond with the challenge that God gives us? Because the Red Sea experience is coming. The question is, what will you do with it? What will you do with it?